Good afternoon. I'm Sergeant Josh Dalbrick, and welcome to the April 2nd virtual town hall with General Ray Odierno, the Chief of Staff of the Army. Today we're going to be fielding questions with soldiers here at Fort Hood. If you have any questions, please feel free to tweet them at Gen Ray Odierno. Sir, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you. So this is the fourth virtual town hall that I've conducted, but it's the first one I've done uh, sitting next to soldiers. It's something I really wanted to do and, and have the opportunity for them to ask me a question face to face and let everybody else in the Army get a chance to hear what you're asking me. Because my guess is, as I've gone around the Army, I find that the questions tend to be very similar uh, depending on wherever I visit. So I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, it is a great way for us to interact and ask whatever questions that are on your mind. You know, we, uh, the Army is a big organization, but one that is very important. And our soldiers are very important to everything that we do, so it's important that I get feedback. I'm just going to start with one comment. There was, I, I understood yesterday, I announced that we're going to change the tattoo policy yesterday, and I'm told it was, everybody thought it was an April Fool's joke. And in fact, I want to verify it is not. We, we, are, we are changing the policy, and uh, that will, the details of that will come out shortly. So uh, with that, I'm ready for questions. My question is regarding enlisted promotions. Uh, with the other branches of service, using technical tests as part of the uh, process for promotion to the next string, uh, what are the chances of the Army adopting that, especially in regards to technical MOSs? So uh, actually, we're, we're doing a review of this. I, so first off, uh, it, I think it depends on the MOS. So I think there, there are some MOSs that are so technical, I think we might have to go to something like that. And, and one I would throw out there would be our new cyber MOS that we have. But I will say this. The one thing I will, I will always, even though we want to use technical, we might use some technical tests, the Army is still about being a well-rounded individual. And so we want you to be able to be, you know, what's important to us is also being technically competent, but being a leader, being physically fit, uh, being able to work in teams, because that's, that's who we are. So I don't want to lose that. But I think there are certain MOSs that we have to review to see where a technical test might be more relevant and possible. So that's part of the review we're going to do as we, as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Second Lieutenant Joshua Lease from the 89th Military Police Brigade. Uh, recently, you've expressed concern over tiered readiness, uh, citing reduction in Army forces and increased global instability, particularly in Eastern Europe, Middle East, North Africa. My question is, sir, specifically in regards to training, how do we as an Army, um, and as at the unit level in particular, continue to prepare and train for ongoing miss missions, such as those in Korea and Afghanistan, but also maintaining flexibility and training for those unforeseen events? I, I think a, cu a couple things. I, I, I would just say the number one piece of any unit that's training is training in what your core functions are and being an expert in those core functions. If it's a brigade combat team, you've got to be able to maneuver as a brigade, defend as a brigade, conduct off offensive operations as a brigade. If it's a logistical support unit, you've got to be able to conduct your logistics in a field environment, expeditionary nature. And if we do those basic things, I think no matter what the mission, we can then quickly adapt to a very specific mission. So if, we're, if, we're, if we have our fundamentals down and we're confident that we can do those key tasks that we've been trained on, once we get a mission to go to whether it's Korea or the Middle East, we can then spend the final days of our training focused specifically on that region and that area. And I think that's what we're going to have to do because the challenge that we have today that's different than what we've had before is right now we have operations going on on five different continents. And that's different. We hadn't done that before. So we had maybe two or three, but I see that continuing to be our problem. And, and we don't know where the next problem will pop up. So what we have to do is be fundamentally sound and then, and then orient ourselves towards a specific region. Uh, we have this concept of regionally aligned forces where we do align some forces with specific regions and we expect you to be experts or at least learn more about that region. And we'll continue to identify units to do that as well. Thanks for your question. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Lieutenant Hauser with the 504th uh, Battlefield Surveillance Brigade. Uh, sir, in light of the recent approval for female participation in Ranger School later this year, uh, I'd like to know where do we currently stand on female integration into combat arms MOSs, and what is the way forward? 
So uh, what we've done so far is I have just uh, we've just approved uh, opening up all positions in engineers to females. We're very close to approving all positions in field artillery for females. Uh, Armor and infantry, the decision is going to be uh, sometime in October. Uh, we're still completing the testing on infantry and armor. Uh, we have not yet completed that, and once that's completed, uh, they'll give me uh, feedback, and then we'll make a recommendation. I remind everybody that the decision has already been made to open positions. So that was done by the Secretary of Defense 18 months ago. What I have to do, if what I would have to do is if I decide I want an exception, I would have to then say, why do I believe we shouldn't open armor or infantry to females? And I would have to demonstrate why I think that's important. So, you know, so I think it's going very well. We've been collecting, we've been really doing, going through some significant testing for about two years now. I think we've collected good information. I think it's going very well. And so I will, we will make a final recommendation sometime in October. And uh, again, it'll be, uh, if, 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 if I don't make any recommendation, everything will be opened as of January 1st, 2016. Sir, I'm Sergeant Costco with 48th Chemical Brigade. And first, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, my question for you, sir, is how would you, how would you describe your relationship and other military leaders' relationships with the Commander-in-Chief? Uh, so, first, I've had a unique opportunity uh, in, in a couple jobs that I've held, uh, both as the Commander in Iraq and the Commander as the Chief of Staff of the Army, to work directly with the, with the President. And, uh, you know, what, what I always appreciate, the fact that my voice has always been heard. Uh, he, li he listens and asks our opinion, and we're able to give it to him and provide him our, our, what we think is the right thing to do. And then he, of course, it's up to him to make what the final decision is. But uh, he has been very open in ensuring he gets military advice. And, you know, that's all you can ask for is that he, is, he listens and he, he's willing to understand and, and have a chance for you to voice your opinion, and then he has to make the difficult decision. And so for me, that, that, that's, a, that's a great, that, that's all you can ask for. Uh, and so for me, I think it's been a great experience. And I've had the opportunity to do it with, with two different presidents, and I've found both of them to be very, uh, to be very forthcoming in, in the getting military advice and giving us the opportunity to provide it to them. Uh, under, especially with very important key issues. Sir, I'm PFC Hegberg from 504th Battlefield Surveillance Brigade. My question is, with all of the budget cuts and drawdowns that have been occurring, uh, how do you foresee the future for new soldiers that would consider the military as uh, a possible long-term career choice? So I, I would just say a couple things. Is the, uh, so the Army is going to be an enduring institution. The last, uh, three, the, the last three years and the next three years, we're going to still be reducing a bit. Right now, the plan is we'll stabilize for the active component at about 450,000 soldiers. And there's great opportunities. For, uh, there'll be, continue to be great opportunities for all our soldiers. You know, the one thing about the Army that I, I'm proud of is that no matter where you come from, if you come in, you work hard, you do your job, and you're proficient in your job, you're going to get promoted, you're going to be able to advance, and there'll be plenty of opportunities to do that, and that is not going to change. And I also remind everybody that, you know, every year we're bringing in 60,000 new soldiers. And so, and when that's not going to change. And we're going to have soldiers, we're going to offer reenlistment to soldiers. That's not going to change. And so there's great opportunities. And the one thing I, you know, it's basic. If you, if you do your job, you work hard, you, you continue to improve yourself as an individual, there's all kinds of opportunities. So. I think it's actually pretty exciting times in the Army because we're, we're, we're doing things on so many different places around the world. We've actually now developed a new Army operating concept that's kind of bringing the Army to the future. So I think it's pretty exciting. And I think we're opening up more positions to women. We're opening up, you know, so the Army is becoming a place where more people are going to be able to excel and really improve themselves. So I hope that means people will find there's a lot of opportunity out there. That's my hope, and I, I think that's where we're headed. I know sometimes that's hard to understand because you're hearing downsizing, getting smaller, and you worry, okay, is there going to be a place for me? There, there's plenty of room in the Army for, for soldiers who want to continue to move forward and want to 
want to progress and, and make it a career. I think there would be plenty of opportunities for everybody. I really believe that. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Sean Fresh Pass Kelly from Forest Hill AFSB. Uh, my question is about uh, the EFMP program. Um, are military installations getting more medical specialists? For, for example, on Fort Hood, there are currently no hematologists here on Fort Hood. The closest one is are in uh, Fort Sam. And also, with the medical system, with the, with the civilians, will it, will it merge? So when you go off post, they could be able to view your medical records, sir. So first off, whenever we talk about medical care, um, we have to make decisions on where we put, especially specialists, like the example you gave. And we can't have a, a specialist in every place that we go. We try to pick places to put them where we think they will be able to reach the most amount of soldiers. And we'll continue to do that. And, you know, our medical programs are is larger than any other medical program pretty much in the United States. And so our, our variety of specialists in care are good, but we're spread also across a large part of the United States. So we will provide... Uh, assistance at as many hospitals as we can, but if we can't, as you mentioned, we will bring you and point you to where we have that care. Whether, you know, so for example, at Fort Sam Houston at, at SAMHSA or somewhere else in the Army. Uh, if not, we still have TRICARE, which allows us to utilize specialists off post, and we're going to continue to have a system that allows, if, if it's not available in our medical facility, it will be made available to our soldiers and their family members through our network which is the TRICARE network. We're not moving away from that, and that will continue. You know, for very specific issues such as EFMP, we do not have that at every installation, but it is incumbent on us to make sure that if we don't have it available, it is available in the civilian sector. We give you access to that uh, capability in order to meet whatever medical needs and, and problems you have. We have a question from Twitter, sir. Uh, will all schools like Ranger School, EIB, EFMB be open to all MOSs so that all soldiers can attend? So, uh, no, EIB is specifically infantry, so that's, a, that's an infantry task. And um, so in order to get your EIB, you've got to be an infantryman. Uh, in order to get uh, your medical badge, you've got to be a medic. That, that's the rules. I mean, uh, so those have been designated that way for a very long time. And those are specific MOS tests that we give. In terms of ranger school, today ranger school is open to anyone who is going to a ranger position. And we have ranger positions coded not only in the ranger regiment, but in many divisions. And it's all MOSs. It's signal, MI, uh, uh, fire supporters, infantrymen. You know, so it is already open to all MOSs as long as you're going to a ranger coded slot. And then if there's space available, we'll take all applicants if there's space available to those schools. So today it is open to all MOSs. We're doing a, a test for, uh, we're doing a pilot for females, and after that's done, we'll make a decision on females in Ranger School. Uh, obviously, as we open up more and more positions, it makes sense that we'll continue to have Ranger School open to women, but we'll do that assessment after the pilot. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Sergeant Roars of the 3rd Cavalry Regiment. My question is, sir, with the proposed cuts to soldiers and their families' benefits, how do you see these changes affecting resources such as child care, dental, and medical coverage? And what is the Army's plan to combat these expenses to soldiers, sir? Yeah, so this is a, this is a difficult question. But I, so first off, child care is not going to change. We're going to maintain the, the child care system. We have a, I know sometimes if you're using it, it might not feel that way, but we have a very affordable child care system. And we're going to continue to have that. That is not going away. Uh, we are going to, the medical coverage is not going to change for our soldiers and our, um, and our families. Uh, we're going to, it might change the system a little bit, but, but the system will cover our soldiers and their family members. Uh, we, we, we've made a conscious, we're trying to make it more efficient. Uh, so there might not, so instead of having three TRICARE options, it might just be one, but it'll still provide the care that's necessary. Um, so I, I think we're doing okay. In terms of pay and benefits, what we're doing is we're not decreasing pay. We're decreasing the increase of pay. And I, let me explain what I just said there. One of the problems we've gotten into is the rate of pay is increasing so quickly, it's, it, it's causing us a problem in affordability. So, for example, the cost of a soldier has doubled since 2001 to today. In 2001, the average, um, this is average, 
The average cost of a soldier army was $45,000 a year. Today it's 90000 If we don't to get more efficient in seven or eight years from now, it'll be up to 120 to 130,000. And if it continues to go up, what'll happen is we'll have to reduce, again, the number of soldiers we have because we won't be able to afford it. So we want to try to balance that. So what we're trying to do is come up with methods that are still, so instead of, we're not going to decrease pay, but we're going to decrease pay raise. So instead of a two, point, a two percentage pay raise, it might be 1% pay raise. And that saves billions of dollars, actually, in the out years if we do that. We believe, it will, and we'll continue to keep track to make sure our soldiers are being paid commensurate with what their service is and how it compares to civilian employment, and make sure that we stay in line with that as we make these recommendations. But it's key that we, we really take a hard look at this. So the other thing we're looking at for those who want to make a career is retirement. It's not that we're going to make, uh, we're just going to, th there might be ways that people might like retirement better, where, where you get you're able to contribute, and it's matching contr contributions to a uh, 401k, for example. And in the end, actually, you end up with more money, but it actually is cheaper. So we're looking at that now. So we've got to look at all of these different aspects and see how we can give you great benefits because of your service, but, make, but see if we can do it a bit cheaper way than we are today, a more efficient way. And that's really what we're trying to do. I will, the one thing I'll say to all our soldiers is I'm, I'm absolutely focused on making sure that you are compensated for the sacrifices you and your family make. And we're not going to walk away from that. And that's number one on my mind as we have these discussions. And, and I think that's everyone's on everyone's mind as we go forward with this. Sir, Lieutenant Christiana Fairfield, 48th Chemical Brigade, West Point Class 2014. Sir, when you spoke to my class in September 2013, a question regarding Syria was discussed. In your answer, you stated to the effect that Syria is no longer about Syria, but much more complex. In the year and a half since that discussion, the complexity of the situation in the Middle East has significantly increased as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria has emerged and Yemen is descending into civil war. What will be the Army's role against ISIS and in the Middle East, and how much input will you and other senior Army leadership have in the formation of the policy and military objectives that will drive Army missions going forward. Thanks. So here, here's what I would say, is I would say uh, I still stick by my statement I made back in September 2013. And the underlying nature is the sectarian nature of what's going on in the Middle East, the Sunni-Shia competition, which has spilled over into Yemen. That's really what that is. You have the Houthis and, the, and the, some of the Sunnis fighting each other for control of Yemen. And, uh, we're seeing that we're seeing that occur in Iraq and Syria. That's kind of the basis of what's going on. I think you're, you're starting to see it spill a little bit into Bahrain and some other places. So that's that's going to continue to happen. I think still what I would say is as we go forward, we part the United States by itself cannot solve this problem. It's it's got to be solved by Arabs. They've got to help solve this problem because. If we try to insert ourselves in the middle of this uh, without help from other Arab nations, it's going to cause more, problem, more, more problems than, than, than solutions. So what we're trying to do now is work through Arab nations to trying to work this and solve this problem among themselves. And there's several lines. One is giving them the capability to do it. Others is we've got to have a moderate discussion about Islam. The, you know, 99% of all, all uh, Muslims are moderate. The problem is that 1% who are radicals who are now driving the conversation, are driving the, what's going on uh, inside of the Middle East. And so we've got to, they've got to help us with that. We can't do that. So I think our role is, as we develop objectives and policies, we have to come up with a total Middle East strategy that allows us to think through how we solve this problem as a whole, working through our partners in the Middle East and working with them to solve this problem over the long term. This is something that's going to go on for another long period of time. And w what we don't want to do is say we're going to take this on ourselves and solve this problem because that, that won't work. And so what, what, what we have to do is develop a, a total policy. We have, to, we, have to get, we have to work it with our Arab partners that we have. And then we have to make sure that militarily we're there to do what we're asked to do, which could be anywhere from training and advising to, if it, if it continues to de deteriorate, 
potentially conducting military operations with our Arab partners, not independently. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Private First Class Mendez, and I'm from the 11th Signal Brigade. And my question to you today is, what opportunities will junior soldiers have for promotion and career advance despite the upcoming reduction in force structure? So one of the things that we're focused on is ensuring that we maintain historical levels of promotion rates. You know, for the enlisted force, it's, uh, it's, it's of course, difficult because it's incumbent also on your MOS. So each MOS has different promotion levels depending on how many people are in it uh, and, 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 and how many people are competing to be promoted. You know, so historically, for example, 11 Bravos have gotten promoted faster than everybody else. And the reason is we have more in that MOS than anywhere else, and, uh, and, and, and there's less people competing for promotions. Frankly, in the, uh, as we were growing the Army, as we were getting bigger in 2006, 7, 8, 9, promotion rates were too high. Actually, we were promoting too many people, in my mind, because we weren't promoting everybody that was qualified. What we're now going to do is we're going back to historical levels where we'll promote which I think is at the right level. So there'll be opportunities in every MOS to be promoted. And it'll be competitive, but everyone will have an opportunity to get promoted the way we've always have in the Army at historical level. So I think there's plenty of, going to be plenty of opportunity. That's one of the reasons why we're downsizing, frankly, is, is, is that as we downsize, it, it'll make sure that we can promote at the same levels that we always have. Because if we keep excess people and we take structure down, then you, you, it'll slow down promotion. So, so in a lot of ways, you'll see that this is part of us ensuring that we continue to have promotion rates. The Army cannot survive if we're stagnant, where nobody can get promoted. Well, our strength is allowing people to come in, and those who are doing their jobs and excelling are able to, uh, to get promoted, and get promoted as fast as, as possible based on their experience level, based on their technical level, based on their physical capabilities, and we don't, we're not ever going to lose that. And so, you know, and for officers, you know, promotion rates might be a little lower for a few years, but they will go back to historical norms. And uh, competition is good. We want competition, but we want it to be reasonable competition where we continue to promote and people can set goals for themselves and meet those goals. Good afternoon, <coughs> good afternoon sir. My name is Sergeant King from First Medical Brigade. Sir, in recent years, we've seen many changes to our benefits program such as minimal 1% annual pay raise, BAH reduction, proposed changes to our real retirement program, and maybe many more changes to come in the future. Sir, my question to you is, what is your message to our soldiers and family members to keep positive attitude during these difficult times in, in yeah, the Army? Yeah, thank you. No, great question. So first off, I would tell you the 1% the pay raises are temporary. Uh, they're two to three years, and then they'll go back to normal. Because believe it or not, by just doing it for two to three years, it saves like $25 billion. In the, it's an incredible number because it compounds as it goes forward. So, so it's only a two or three year time we have to do this and it'll be done. Let me, let me talk a bit for BAH because this is one of my pet peeves. So here's what, I don't know if you realize, but I'm gonna tell you how BAH, I've been around this for a long time. This is how BAH works. So every year we do a survey, and you fill out a survey on how much it costs to live wherever it is. Let's take Fort Hood. And you fill out the survey and say it costs this much, and then what we do is we say, okay, we're going to raise BAH, BAH this amount, and we publish it in the Army Times. So what happens when that happens? Rents go up. So in reality, you're not getting any extra money. It's going in the pockets of those who are renting. So what we're trying to do is break this cycle of we want to make it reasonable so you know, we're not just putting pockets in the, in the landlords and that we're, we're, we're trying to stabilize the cost of housing and still provide you the amount of money necessary. And so we're going we're gonna to continue to review this over time, and I think it's going to work out. If it doesn't, we're going to have to go back and review it and then see what we have to do to increase BAH again as we go forward. I'm, I'm telling you, I think the proposal, in terms of retirement, I, every proposal we have, first I want you to know, everybody will be grandfathered who is currently serving. And any retirement proposal that is put out there, I think will be one that everybody considers to be, that they like better, or they think is more options than what we have today. 
And so my hope is as we, go, as we come to a solution, which we have not come to yet, it'll be one that is, gives people choices and, and will allow them to think, it, 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 which I think they'll like. And I think, I think for the new generation, they might like that better than, than what we're doing today. So, so I would tell everyone that, we, as I said earlier, my goal, Chuck, we are, we are very concerned to make sure that you remain compensated for the sacrifices that you make. And, and we're dedicated to ensure that you are, you, we, we, we give you what you need in order to, to excel in your job, raise a family, and do it in such a way that's appropriate with what we're asking you to do. And, and uh, you know, these are all really difficult questions, but everybody is work watching this very carefully because we want to make sure that we sustain the all-volunteer force. And one of my top priorities is sustaining the quality all-volunteer force that we have today. We don't want to walk away from that. And, uh, our next question is from Twitter, sir. Uh, do you think the Military Compensation and Reform Commission recommendations will harm retention after such massive downsizing? So we're actually having a conversation about this. There are some of the recommendations in there that I do worry about. One is the recommendation on health care I'm a bit worried about. And uh, the other one is uh, the retirement. I, I think the, re the retirement uh, actually could discourage people from staying in from 10 to 30 years. And so I worry about that a little bit. So we're, we're working with the commission to adjust that, to make sure that they don't um, have a long-term impact on the Army. And so we're in kind of discussions about that now. And I have had many, many meetings on this, and I have several more ahead of me because we're trying to work our way through it. Uh, because we do not want, as I said earlier, we do not want a, uh, a package that we believe actually hurts our ability to sustain the all-volunteer force. So we're watching, we're looking at it very carefully, and we will provide our recommendations on the commission uh, here pretty sh shortly. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Sergeant Davis with the 48th Chemical Brigade. I know there are going to be some changes to our military pay and benefits, but what is the chance that it's going to affect the Army Tuition Assistance Program? And, uh, and so how? Yeah, no, the Tuition Assistance Program is going to continue. The only thing we're looking at, tuition, tuition assistance is good. The only thing we're looking at is when does tuition assistance start? So, you know, do you have to serve two years before you can use tuition assistance? Uh, you know, so that's what we're kind of looking at now. That's the only change that we're looking at, is when do you start, you know. You've got to earn it. You know, maybe, earn, you know, two years of good service and you get, and then you can use tuition assistance throughout. Uh, but we're still, we're still having discussions about that. But otherwise, tuition assistance should stay. We might, we might reduce the amount of money you get per credit, mm -hmm. but if we do that, it'll be in line with what we think people are charging for that, so it shouldn't hinder you. So those are just adjustments, but tuition assistance as a whole will stay. Sir, Second Lieutenant Heater, First Medical Brigade. Sir, in reference to the Military Compensation and Retirement uh, Modernization Commission's recommendation for moving from a 20-year retirement plan to a 401k retirement plan, do you see this being implemented? And if yes, what does that time frame look like? Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I, so I don't know yet. I would say I think there'll probably be some sort of a 401k option in the retirement plan, uh, and we'll, you know it's a matching plan. Um, and actually, the, the current the proposal is the first couple of years it's a two percent, and then it goes to go up to five percent depending on how much you put in. It's pretty good, uh, but but we we have to look at. Um, uh, so what'll happen is it'll, it's probably two or three years before it would go into effect. But again, everyone would be grandfathered or given a choice. So anybody currently serving, my, you might get a choice to say, I, I want to do that program or I want to stay with the current program. That's the position that we're taking on it. Thanks, sir. Cool. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Sergeant First Class Ingham of 85th Civil Affairs Brigade. Um, sexual assault victims um, have filed a lawsuit uh, seeking to remove commanders from sexual assault cases, alleging that commanders cannot be fair and impartial because they often know the victims or the alleged offender. If they're successful in having commanders removed from these cases, what impact would this have on the Army and the SHARP program? Yeah, so a couple things is, uh, so two of the cases they cited, by the way, the individuals got put away for multiple, multiple, multiple years. Cool. 
So I would argue the commanders did their job and prosecuted them, which I find odd. Uh, the second thing I would just say is um, the problem with the bill they have out there right now is actually greater than sexual assault. It deals with every felony, which is problematic. I believe that the statistics bear out that the military prosecutes at a much higher level than anybody else in society when it comes to sexual assault, sexual harassment. We, we, our, our rates are so much higher. We, we go to court much, fa much quicker and much at a, a much higher percentage than any civilian court. Uh, our results are harsher than most civilian courts. So uh, I think we're heading in the right direction. So I think it's a mistake if we change this and take it out of the commander's hands. Uh, in fact, I would argue it might even make it worse. And so there's, no, there's nothing that's shown me in their recommendation how it makes it better. It's just different. And I think commanders and, and the chain of command is responsible for the morale, welfare of the unit across the board. And it's important that we continue to make sure that stays as, as, as we move forward. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Private First Class Stanek in the 36th Engineer Brigade. Lately, there's been talk about changing and improving the PT plan and introducing MOS-specific PT tests. I was wondering, when can we expect these changes and what will they consist of? So, I just took a brief on this about two or three weeks ago. Um, and so I think what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna stay with a PT test that everybody takes. Uh, that is a basic PT test that we'll use for promotion points and so it's even throughout everything. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a functional test that helps you to define whether, how you're developing for a specific MOS, whether it's infantry, artillery, armor, pick your MOS, that'll help you to better conduct your, your MOS. And so we're still working on the details of that, but that's the direction we're headed. I, I don't, we have not yet defined the events enough for me to really, so I think it's still about a year or so away before we'll look at going towards this. And there's still some work and analysis that we have to do yet. I thought it would be much simpler than it's been, actually. It's been a little bit more complicated than I thought. Uh, I thought we'd be able to do this in an appropriate right way, but the problem we have is I don't want to disadvantage soldiers. I gotta make sure everybody's treated fairly uh, as we assess promotions and other things, and that plays a role in this. And I gotta make sure we do it right, and so we've run into some obstacles because we want to make sure it's fair for every soldier. But we're, we're continuing to look at it. So my answer to you is we're not quite there yet. It's gonna be a little bit longer before we get there. Thank you, sir. Next question is from Twitter, sir. Are there going to be any plans to allow prior service soldiers that deployed as part of another branch to wear former wartime service shoulder sleeve insignia? Uh, so I'm assuming from another branch of service, that is up to their branch of service. I, I can't. All I can do is develop policies for the Army. And so the Army is the only service actually that does wear combat patches. Uh, the other services actually do not do that, I don't, as far as I know. And so, but it's up to their services to decide whether they can wear a combat patch of the Army uh, on, on, their, on their shoulder. If you're talking about a patch of another service that you might want to wear as an Army soldier, uh, I'll have to take a look at that. I'm not sure there's that many out there, uh, but I'll have to take a look. I'm not sure where we are on that. Afternoon, sir. Sergeant Kovac from the 3rd Cavalry Regiment. With the new uniform pattern coming out, what is the Army's plan for equipment standardization in the new uniform pattern with the current budget constraints? And when can units expect to see the new equipment? So first off, it's cost neutral. So uh, because as much the money we're spending on buying these uniforms will be the same amount of money we spend on buying the new pattern. So in terms of dollars, it's cost neutral. So sometime at the end of this, at the, at the, the, probably the fall of 15 is when you'll start seeing those become part of the clothing issue bag. Uh, and you'll start seeing them available in clothing sales stores uh, probably a little bit before that. Um, so of course, you know, we issue your initial clothing issue bag and then we give you a clothing allowance to buy uniforms so you would use that then to buy this uniform. But the costs are about the same. There's not, not much different in the cost. And the one thing we learned, we did significant testing, and that pattern 
is very important in protecting ourselves in a variety of environments. And that's why we're going to it, because it really gives us an advantage in protecting us as we get concealment, as we operate in a variety of theaters. And, and if I could just, uh, we are issuing those to soldiers who are deploying now. So if you're deploying to Afghanistan or Iraq and some other places, you are being issued uh, that uniform as you get ready to deploy. Sir, Specialist Remy, 89th Military Police Brigade. Uh, s my question is, since day one of the Army, we get, we get uh, briefs on SHARP, EO, TARP, but we never receive any briefs on retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Is there any plan mm -hmm. to incorporate that into the standard briefs? Yeah, it's, f it's funny that you say that. So part of the recommendation that this commission worked is actually, it, it's twofold. I don't want it, 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 to... It, it builds in some cost and uh, money in order to do financial, what they call financial literacy training. What that means is it would train you not only, it would help to train people on how you would develop a retirement program and how you would, if we go to a new system, would help us to educate all our soldiers on how we would do this. And frankly, what we want to do is set up some independent, there'll be some online uh, knowledge we're doing. We'd probably set up some centers uh, on each installation that would allow you to go get assistance in developing a long-term retirement plan. So that's kind of part of what we're looking at now. So I think you're going to find that, get approved, and we'll start to implement that here pretty in the next couple years. Gotcha. Well, thank you, sir. Great question, by the way. You know, one of the things I do worry about is, you know, it is, it's not easy to understand how to plan long-term financially. Uh, and it's not something that's easily to understand, and so it's incumbent on us to help you to do that, especially if we go to a new retirement plan, because it will e if we go to a 401k system, you want somebody who can help you to make sure you manage that properly, because it will be very important to you uh, as you go towards retirement. But it also would be helpful, even if you don't go towards retirement, to build those knowledge of how you manage your finance. I think that's important. Sir, Sergeant First Class Pace, 407th Army Field Support Brigade. Sir, when Congress makes decisions on retirement benefits, does the Chief of Staff have any influence on their decisions? So what will happen is uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which are the Chiefs of every service and the Chairman, will provide our recommendations. We will provide our recommendations to the uh, President as well as to Congress on what we think they should do. Uh, and so we will also I probably have an opportunity to testify uh, about it and give us our give them, give them our opinion. And if they don't allow us to testify, we will provide our opinion in writing. So yes, we will we will absolutely give them input on what we believe the right thing to do is on this. Uh, that will be uh, that we will t we take that very seriously. Sir P L C Campbell, 85th Civil Affairs Brigade. My question is for low density MOS. How could we stay more proficient on our job when we're in a unit that rarely does the job? So it takes, you know, great question, by the way. It takes, it really it takes innovative leadership and training, but there's lots of, so let me take civil affairs. You know, I would hope that our subordinate commanders are, t there's a lot of opportunity to work with, say, here, Austin City Government, Dallas City Government, in other places where they're doing activities that are similar to what you might have to do if we deploy you somewhere in order to help build infrastructure anywhere and, and understand what it is to do civil affairs work. And I think there's other things that we should, we, we should, be, able to, we should be able to do really good innovative training right here, no matter where you are, whether it's here at Fort Hood or at Fort Bragg or Fort Lewis, anywhere, by using the surrounding communities to help and understand how they manage many of the issues you're going to deal with. And in fact, we did that actually when we were deploying initially in Iraq and Afghanistan because we didn't understand some of the things we're going to have to do. So we reached out to these governments. So what we should be doing is giving you the opportunity to do that. And, and so I will, in fact, so now that you asked me that question, I'm going to make sure that we uh, get our leaders to think about that and, and, and provide that training because it's absolutely critical. Because it's very difficult to train in that MOS on a day-to-day -day basis, but there's ways for us to leverage civilian society to help do that. Sir, I'm Special Sterwin from the 69th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. 
With the Army downsizing and most units slowing down to nine-month deployments, the Air Defense Artillery Branch is increased on deploying to more countries for security footprint as well as staying a 12-month rotation. Soldiers in our branch are feeling more stressed on making up for the loss in our ranks. With our branch being as small as it is, is there any plan to increase the number of soldiers for Patriot Brigades and to prolong more dwell time? So there's a couple things that we're working on. One is first, I, I'm very concerned about our Patriot uh, units because of what you mentioned is the amount of deployments are going on, the repetitiveness of the deployments. And it's something that's got our attention. Uh, there's a couple of ways to go after this. One is we've got to reduce the requirement. I think we're in the process of attempting to try to reduce the amount of deployments and make sure that every deployment we're making to do is absolutely necessary. And so I think the first thing we want to do is try to reduce that so it reduces the amount of rotational, and we're, we're, we're trying to work that now. The other thing we're trying to do is get other countries who are asking for you to help them give assistance to buy systems themselves and train their own individuals to do this on a more, so we don't have to rotate so often as well. And then in the end, we're looking at, you know, there's several things we'll take a look at is, do we have more people, not buy more equipment, but get more people who then, as somebody else is deployed, we can train, take more people and train on the systems that are behind that gives us more unit capability. So we're going to look at all three of those things and try to come up with the right balance. But we know we have a problem. We've got to ease the strain on the air defense uh, units, specifically the Patriot units. And I think THAAD will go the same way as we bring on THAAD units as well. And I'm worried about that. So we're, we're working our way through that. Hello, sir. Specialist Rose, 3rd Cavalry Regiment. My question revolves around recla reclassification of options for soldiers. I'm curious why we have understrength MOSs that are approved to reclassify to, but have no advanced individual training dates for these MOSs within the next year. This then forces soldiers like myself to choose between reenlisting in their current MOS or to separate from service. Uh, first off, um, great question, and uh, I, I want to take a look. What, what, what MOS are you talking about? A specific MOS right now? Um, more so the medical MOSs. Medical sir. MOSs. Okay. Uh, so first off, what we're trying to do obviously is we're trying to reduce those MOSs that are over strength and move them into MOSs that are under strength. So I will I, I'm gonna, I will take back with me. I don't know the specific answer to your question on the AIT availability. But I will take that back and look at the medical MOS and understand why we can't send you to AIT as you want to reclassify into a shortage MOS, because that's exactly what we want you to be able to do. So I'll take a look at it okay, and get you an answer back. All right. Sir, good afternoon. I'm Sergeant Byrne from the Area 69th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. Uh, my question is focused on toxic leadership. We all talk about identifying those individuals in our ranks, but we have not seen any follow-up or for retraining or eliminating those leaders. Is there uh, an ongoing uh, process for identifying and following up on those leaders other than using the o OER or NCOER? So uh, we're starting out at the battalion and brigade commander level. But we're doing 360. They're required to do a 360, anonymous 360, that everybody gets a chance, both those below them, peers and superiors, to evaluate them. And we're using that to collect data. And, and, and then hopefully they use that as a training tool to improve them. And if they don't, we'll then eliminate those. I, I will tell you, we don't announce it, but we are, uh, we have significantly increased over the last three years commanders who've been relieved for toxic leadership uh, who have been identified. In a, and we have done an investigation and found that, in fact, their leadership style is not what we believe it should be. And that's, that's from general officer all the way down to battalion commander. Um, I think at a lower level yet, we still have some work to do to go below that level in terms of trying to identify those leaders who are somewhat toxic. But this is something we're taking very seriously. I think we're making some progress, but we're not there yet. We still have a lot of work to do. We're also, this is also being vetted in all of our educational institutions as well as what's the right way to lead. So we, we have this constant conversation. Um, it is very important to me personally uh, that we take this on. And again, I, say, I think we've made some progress, but we still have some work to do. Sir, I'm Sergeant Thomas, 3rd Cavalry Regiment. Uh, summing off a previ previously asked question, when can we expect the authorized wear of the Army's new uniform and will previously purchased or issued gear and multi-cam be authorized for use with the new pattern? Yeah, so again, I think, I think we're looking at sometime this fall uh, in order for that to happen. Um, 
and then uh, you'll start to see gear available that will then match the new design over time. Um, that will be that will be the issued items will be brought in over over a period of time, but I think you'll start to see the the uniforms and other materials show up in clothing sales stores here, probably by the end of the summer or beginning of the fall, because we're, we're moving forward with that. Um, so I think we're, we're going to we're going to begin to see that pretty quickly. Well, that's all the questions that we have, sir. Well, first off, those are great questions, and. Uh, you know, I always find, I loved having these sessions with soldiers because you ask actually the best questions. And I sit down with officers a lot of times, they don't, they don't, they ask me, they don't ask me good questions. So lieutenants, you know, new, new to the Army and, and uh, soldiers ask me the right questions. Every question you ask me is something that's current and something that is important to the Army. And so I appreciate that. And you've, it, what it tells me is you're paying attention and you're listening and you're, 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 you're also concerned about your Army. And, so thanks for that. I also want to thank you for your service. And I tell everyone that uh, you might not, th everybody comes into the Army for a different reason. We all have our own reasons of why you come into the Army. But in order to raise your right hand and swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States, that puts you in 1% of the United States. And you should be very proud of that. That you're willing to serve and sacrifice and raise your right hand and, and commit yourself to a time of service, no matter how long that might be whether it's four years or 40 years. Uh, you should be proud of that, and I want to thank you for doing that. And I hope that you find an army of the place where you can improve yourself, and that you find it where that you believe you can progress and achieve any, any goal you might want to achieve, because that's what we want it to be. It is not a perfect institution. We have our own issues, but we try to work them as hard as we can. So I hope you find that you'll have the opportunities for you to continue to improve yourself. So, Thank you very much, and thank you for your service. Appreciate it very much. Army Strong, thank you.